Hello and welcome to Behind the Bearcat. This is the podcast where the Northwest Missouri State University Career Services Office chats with Northwest faculty, staff, students, alumni, and friends to hear about their career journeys, how they got to where they are, and how they became Bearcats. I'm Northwest Internship Coordinator Travis Klein. And I'm Hannah Christian, the Assistant Director of Career Services here at Northwest. And our guest on today's podcast, a double Bearcat, uh, who was actually a graduate of the first cohort of higher ed leadership master's programs here at Northwest. Um, he's currently the executive director for student recruitment. Please welcome Jeremy Waldier. Or Waldier. Waldier. Gosh, yeah. dang it. Travis. <laughs> I've been called worse. So it's. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> Travis had a lot of bloopers in the first season, and yes. I, I've been trying to not do that, but, you know. <sighs> I came very close to saying the Northwest Missouri State University admissions office in the intro. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. So welcome, Jeremy. Yes. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for having me. So, yeah, yeah. So on this, so uh, we were talking right at the beginning there about Travis's boss situation, his former boss, because he worked in admissions and then mm -hmm. myself currently uh, on this podcast was kind of funny. Um, can you tell us a little bit? about what you do as the executive director of student recruitment here at Northwest. Yeah, um, it's actually multifaceted, I guess. I, uh, I really work with first-time freshmen uh, is the big focus of what I do. And that's working with the regional reps who go out on the road and travel and talk to students about becoming a Bearcat or their future journey to Northwest or another institution. Um, but also I kind of, I guess, assist other markets like the KC Center, the online student population, uh, really just helping with strategy and then also helping them kind of think through like recruitment strategies and ways that we can assist them as well as, you know, the first time freshman market, as I mentioned. Can you give me an example of maybe two different groups of people and how you design two different strategies for that? Yeah, probably the first time freshman is the one I'm most familiar with. And so that's really, you know, we do a lot of uh, focus on a student in the high school setting. So we look at sophomores and juniors and build communication plans to start to build name brand recognition of Northwest with that student population. And then once they become a senior, then we do a little more in regards to visiting the high school, um, sending more targeted emails about applying for admission, and then really just walking them through that senior year and the steps they would take to become a Bearcat and be here on campus. So that's kind of a 30,000 foot overview of of the first time freshman. The transfer is probably the next market I would think about. And that's the student who's went to a community college and you know went for two years or a year and then they want to transfer into Northwest. And so their journey is a little different. You know, they've experienced some college atmosphere. And so they really um, the strategy is similar in the sense that we want to walk them through the transition from their current school to Northwest. Uh, but there's definitely not as many details because they they kind of know the journey and, and they do have a lot of questions about how credits transfer in, but it's definitely a different path that they follow and different questions that they have. Yeah, huh, that's interesting. Um, so I also like to start at the beginning of your career journey, right? All the way back to, I don't know, 10 year old Jeremy or 15 year old Jeremy. Um, Jeremy, what was your very first paid job? Yeah, I, I know I'm a, I'm a fan of the show, so I know that often people kind of talk about being on the farm. I'm a farm kid, and so that wasn't paid. I was told my room and board was my payment for working mm -hmm. on the farm, uh, but my first job was actually, uh, I was an arcade manager. Uh, I grew up in Ravenwood, which is a small town, so it's definitely not the palace on Stranger Things if you're a fan of that <laughs> show, uh, but we had a little lo local uh, arcade called the Blue Jays Nest that uh, our band director started as a way for kids to kind of have something to do after school. And so I was in marching band and worked with uh, Elmer Jackson to kind of get that off the ground and running. So our, our arcade had like four of the traditional Pac-Man, you know, those type of games. And we had the pool table and we had some food and candy for kids to come in and hang out um, after school. So that was technically my first paid position. And so that was pretty eye-opening and, and fun. I worked with a lot of the local kids in the community working the hours. And then I spent a lot of time in there too, because I, I like to play video games. So that was a, a double win for me. Yeah. That actually sounds like maybe the best first job ever, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Like if you're a kid, right? <laughs> yeah. It, it really worked well. And to be honest, like that was my, I think my, my career path when I was in high school and then when I attended Northwest, I really wanted to own my own business. And so this kind of, in a sense, gave me exposure to that. Um, 
Elmer being a band director, really he was tied up during school and after school. And so really I kind of took the reins and ran with it. And so it, it was really good for me to kind of get that first experience and see that this is kind of the career path I want to go down. So what made you want to own your own business? Like, was that just something that you'd always kind of as a kid dreamed about? Yeah, I, I really, I can't put my thumb or my finger on it, to be honest. I just really like the idea of having a business and, and starting from the ground up and kind of controlling the decisions that go into owning your own business. And so, you know, I, I guess in a sense, it's being your own boss is what I really thought about. And so that was kind of appealing to me um, was to know that I could kind of make decisions and see how it impacted the the company or the store that I was running. And to be more specific, I really wanted to do like a sporting goods store. I'm kind of into athletics and played a lot of sports in high school. And so I thought owning like a, a sporting goods store would be really cool. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. So is that what drove you to choose marketing and management as your major as a student? Yeah, I'm, I'm really bad about making decisions, I guess, when it comes to my personal life. And so I, I kind of knew marketing and management is what I wanted to go into. But honestly, I didn't select a major until I was a junior at Northwest. And so, um, you know, those first two years, I took the gen eds. Year three, I took this core class specific to business majors and then focused on marketing and management year four. And um, yeah, I think that's really why I, I wanted to go into marketing and management was that focus on owning my own business. And again, just being blunt, like um, I, we don't have a lot, our family didn't have a lot of money at the time. And so I was really nervous about the investment I would have to make. And uh, again, being kind of, um, I guess, tough to make decisions for me. I was a little concerned about being unsuccessful and losing that money in an investment of your own store. So that's kind of what led me to thinking more about being a manager for like a corporate store mm -hmm. where they provide the backing financially. And then I still kind of own the store and make the decisions. Did you work while you were going to school here at Northwest? And if so, what did you do? Yeah, I worked at Service Lube here in town. So um, that was the kind of the first job after the Blue Jays Nest when I was going to Northwest. So I started as like the front desk assistant and then kind of helped check clients in or check customers in. And then also kind of did some of the pit work where we would like top off the oil, check the fluids and different things in that location. So that was really a great position for me to have too, kind of working with different clientele and different people, a lot of adults, a lot of people from different companies in town. So that was really good customer service experience for me that I think was extremely beneficial. And I always remember my first day at that job because um, Butch Hunt was my supervisor. He's one of what I would say, one of my idols or peers or someone I look up to. And the first day on the job, they're like, okay, we're gonna have you go out and mow the yard. I'm like, oh, that's easy task, no big deal. And so there was a little patch of grass. And so I was mowing that yard. And lo and behold, I hit like a piece of asphalt or rock and it went through one of the customer's windows. So the driver's side window on the vehicle. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, this is a great first day. So I have to go in and tell my boss, I just knocked the window out of one of our customer's vehicles. So walked in and I told Bush and he was very understanding, but believe me, um, that's probably one of the days where I started to lose my hair. Cause that was pretty, <laughs> walk in and tell him that. Uh, a fun fact about Butch. Uh, so when I worked at Nottoway County administration building, Butch was a, a, our janitor there. So, and his little office was right outside my office door. So I had many good conversations with Butch as well. Yeah. So, so Another interesting thing about that, so you went from working with students, right, where you're your primary customer uh, of your arcade position to a, a very different type of customer service, same customer service skill set, um, different customers, right? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing, there's a lot of similarities, but being, I guess, younger than most adults who came in the service loop, that was a little intimidating for me at first. So I think over time, I became more comfortable with that. But that was the biggest transition for me was working in an arcade setting where it's peer to peer for most situations and being in a small town, you knew most of the kids coming in. So that made it very easy to go into an environment where many of the customers coming in, you may not know. And so uh, that really helped with my confidence and, and just interacting with different people from different backgrounds. Uh, Travis knows this from a little bit about me, but I'm an extrovert, but really an introvert. Uh, <laughs> I really fear public speaking. And so I'm honestly the kid who at Northwest, I enrolled in speech first semester. And then I put it off until my senior year because I was just so terrified of giving a presentation to a class. And so doing that senior year, it I wouldn't recommend that for many students, but for me, it really helped because 
working at Service Lube and then doing presentations for other classes helped me build up and build that confidence so that I could complete that speech class because I was was terrified. <laughs> yeah, Jeremy and I are almost exact opposites. Like I love public speaking and hate small groups and Jeremy is awesome in a group and hates public speaking. So when we worked together, it worked really well because we yeah. complimented each other. <laughs> I always think about Travis and when we had like Distinguished Scholars Day and different on-campus events for large masses, I was always so excited to have him on staff because he was <laughs> comfortable in that setting and I didn't have to worry about doing it. So <laughs> that's a key, you know, you know, for people who listen, maybe if you work at Northwest and you don't know Travis that well, Travis is really good at presentations like let's just talk about his clicker skills and he can make the bullets fly in and he just is so like calm and cool and collected and his presentations are just really like a, an art form yeah so just don't put me in a group of people because I will, <laughs> I will fail there but on stage I'm good and yeah. I always like I like where the bullets come in and I can never <laughs> get the timing down like Travis can so yeah. So did you work then all the way through college at Service Loop um, or did you have other positions? No, I really, I stayed there for the duration of my time at Northwest. I worked probably 35 to 40 hours a week um, just to have a paycheck. Uh, so, you know, to help pay with tuition and fees, but um, also eat out. I like to eat out quite often. So <laughs> that was a way to kind of make that happen. So what was your plan? So you're working, right? And, and I also worked a lot as a student, almost 40 hours a week. What were your graduation plans? Did you make plans? Did you say like, I'll wait to decide when I get there? Yeah, I would say like the realization about December that I was gonna be finishing up in the next year really kind of started to hit. So I really focused on working on my resume and, and working on that aspect of what I needed to do. A little different day, a little different age. So internships were not required. And since I was working at Service Lube, I didn't really think about that path um, or taking advantage of those opportunities that we offer. Would highly recommend that to students now. And that's something I wish I would have done to maybe gain exposure in a larger metropolitan area or something different than, than Maryville or Ravenwood. Um, but for me, I just started working on the resume and kind of putting feelers out. Again, growing up in Ravenwood and having family and friends here in Maryville, I wanted to stay close to home. And so I started looking for opportunities here in town. And so that really led to my next job where I actually worked at the Daily Form newspaper here in town as an advertising rep. And so I had clients here in town that were local businesses and I would meet with them weekly and talk about um, upcoming promotions at the newspaper and if they were interested in placing an ad in the paper or doing different things with that. So that kind of built off that experience of working with adults and uh, feeling comfortable in that environment. And then I think after a year, I moved up to advertising manager and then I kind of had the chance to oversee the other um, advertising reps and kind of take more of a manager responsibility piece at that point in time. Did you feel like you Okay, so I, I'm trying to ask this question. Okay. Um, there's a difference between being an individual contributor, right? So being an, a, a sales rep, and I think business majors maybe struggle with this a little more than other things because, you know, you can be a sales rep, you can be uh, advertising sales rep, an individual contributor at a high level in a company, and you can really be paid well. S sales reps are incredibly well paid. Yeah. But then to switch over, like, the role between an individual contributor and then a management role, like what were some of the biggest differences for you? And what's your perspective on that? Like being an individual contributor maybe versus being like a manager of individual contributors? Yeah, the, the structure at the Daily Form was a little different. So even when I moved to the management position, honestly- still they, selling probably. Yeah, they, you honestly at that point, you have some of what I would say are the set accounts. So in this day and age, it would probably be like your high V, the companies that typically do ads every week. So- um, with that admissions position, it was base salary plus commission. So yeah, you kind of set your own um, goals and targets and what you wanted to achieve from a financial standpoint. And so the more aggressive or, you know, the more companies and clients you work with, the better um, benefit you could have from a payment perspective. And then moving into management, I guess the biggest transition or change for me in that role was now I'm responsible for other staff who are expected to sell and contribute. And so motivating was one of the biggest things that was new for me. And probably I struggled with it first because I'm pretty competitive, pretty motivated. So I want to, you know, do well. And so sometimes we would have reps who it was just a job. And so it was hard for them to gain motivation and call on their clients often and, and to meet their goals. And so that was, that was tough. And 
just being frank, I'm a pleaser. Like I like to please everyone and keep everybody happy. And so sometimes having those frank conversations about staff who were not pulling their weight, that, that was always kind of tough. And it was good experience, but I'm not going to lie. Those are still conversations that I struggle with. Um, not my favorite thing to do, but uh, it has made me a little more comfortable in that environment. But, I, mm. but again, I think that was the biggest difference is being a self-motivator that can help you move up the ladder a little faster in, in, in that type of environment. Hmm. I think too, like competition, like, like for people who are motivated by numbers or by like that, that competition. And I think sometimes if you're an athlete, you kind of understand like that competitive spirit, right? Like, yeah, and that's sell more than you. I want to, I want to be better. And that's probably where I might've crossed the line from time to time. because I, I like a little friendly competition. I know not everyone likes that. And so sometimes when I would have nice months of sales, I, I wouldn't do it to be facetious or rude. I was just like, you know, patting myself on the back, but also just to do it in jest to, to kind of build the team up. If somebody was having a really bad month, I wasn't going to rub it in their face at that point in time. But it was more like if I was a, a, ahead of somebody like a hundred dollars or something like that, just to use a little humor to say, good job, but also like, Hey, I got you this month or whatever. So, <laughs> and that's, I guess that's one of my things. And Travis knows this from working with me too. Like, I think humor is kind of the backbone of work and life in general. Like, I, I love to laugh. I love to have a good time outside of work. And that's what I really try to instill in our office too. Like what we do is high pressure. Like we need a, a strong enrollment to maintain the institution and to, to do well as, an, as a school. But I want it to be a work environment that's also fun. I want people to enjoy coming to work and we can have some banter and joke about different things that are happening in the office as well as outside the office. And so that's what I really try to stress. And again, being a little older, the, the old Nike slogan from when I was when growing up was work hard, play hard. And that's, that's kind of the, I guess, the backbone of my philosophy to, to say like, hey, let's have fun. But when it comes to taking care of families or doing the work we need to do, then we put 110% into that at that time. Absolutely. So when did you transition from like private industry outside of Northwest to coming back to work for the university? Yeah. So after the daily form, I wanted, again, getting back into that entrepreneurial feel, I had an opportunity to be like a manager in training at a jewelry store in St. Joe. So that was a big transition for me growing up in Ravenwood and living in Maryville my entire life. So that was kind of stepping outside of my comfort zone. And um, I worked there for, I think, two years. And then I did that part time for another year. Uh, but again, I, I like to use the word frank, just being honest, I guess. That really wasn't for me. Um, I've always wanted to, quote unquote, sell a product I felt was beneficial for the people I was working with. And that industry was really tough because there was a lot of pressure to sell and to make the sale at any cost. And a lot of times they were pushing us to, to sell, to promote credit card usage or debt mm -hmm. and the interest rates on their cards were astronomical. So I don't mean to talk bad about a company, but that just wasn't the right fit for me. And so I often scoured the Northwest website and the admissions rep position came open. And um, again, I applied, I applied five times before I received my first interview. And it, the job, why I really, what was interesting to me or what appealed to me about the job was it, it's a product or a service that I think is valuable to anyone or that one is, wants to continue their career path. And by that, if they come to Northwest, great. You know, I feel like we're selling a product or promoting a product that can help the student in the long run. If they select another institution, that's great in my eyes too. At least they're, you know, continuing their education. Or if they go to trade school or another path, at least we're kind of helping them map out the direction they want to go. And uh, so that's what really led me back to, to Northwest and the position here on campus. And uh, started as a admissions rep, I had Kansas City. And so I was visiting 100 to 150 high schools in the fall and then in the spring too. My territory was kind of Kansas City down to Lake of the Ozarks. And it's probably my favorite position of any position that I currently have or have had because you kind of build your own schedule. So it has some of that entrepreneurial feel to it. Like you build your schedule. Uh, it's traveling throughout Southwest Missouri in the fall, which with the leaves turning, it was just very scenic and interacting with a lot of different st students and parents and counselors. And really, again, it's just a positive feel where a lot of students are excited about that next chapter in their life. And it really motivated me. And it, it's really, it seemed like the ideal fit. So I'm glad I kind of continued. And that's another piece of advice I would give students. Like if there's, if there's a career that you want to follow or a job that you want, don't give up based on the first denial. Again, I applied to, for that position several times and um, 
when I finally got the opportunity, believe me, when I walked in the interview, I was prepared. Uh, the job, inter the application or the outline of what was required talked about knowing the schools in your territory. And so being, again, local and not really a lot of experience with Kansas City or the school districts, I was kind of nervous about that. And so, again, you have to remember, this is kind of like pre-technology, so uh, not a lot of technological resources. I went out and printed off every high school website uh, for 150 schools and walked in with like a stack of paper and kind of, I wouldn't say I slammed it down on the desk, but I said, this is my <laughs> downfall. I don't really know a lot about the schools, but I'm willing to learn. And here's the documents I'll use to kind of gain that knowledge. And I think that was probably the key to, um, Roger Pugh was the director at that time. And he was a, he's kind of a data geek. I think he would allow me to say that. And so I think <laughs> that kind of impressed him that I was uh, really into the data aspect of knowing more about the schools and the information about those districts. Yeah, that's... I will say too, because again, we're being candid here. I interviewed and we were talking about Kansas City and honestly, you know, went to like a Royals game or some of the social aspects, but never really a lot of the of knowledge about Kansas City. And we were doing the interview and a little different. They had the, the rep who was in the position actually as part of the interview, which hmm. is kind of unique. And she was sharing experiences about, um, you know, some like being in a, a store and it was held up and just some really random stuff that really kind of scared me. Like I was like, Oh my gosh, is this what Kansas city is all about? <laughs> and so it kind of made me step back. And, and so I did talk to some peers who lived in Kansas and like, no, that doesn't happen often. So uh, again, just a random story that I like to tell, but that, uh, that was kind of interesting. Hmm. So how long were you an admissions rep? And then what made you choose to move up? You're managing yeah, um, admissions reps now? Yep. Um, I was in that role about three years. So three years is about the time I traveled. And I would say part of it, and Travis has been on the road, he, he knows what I'm getting ready to say, but it's, you start to get a little worn down from the road. Like when you travel, we were putting 35,000 miles on a state car in a, in a four month time frame. So you do tend to kind of wear down and get a little bogged down by the travel aspect of the job. It's kind of cyclical. You go out for a while, you come in, and then you go back out. But after three years, I felt like it was kind of a, a time to move up, and the opportunity actually came. So when when they talked about becoming the associate, that that was appealing to me. Again, getting back into some more of the managerial aspect. I um, still could travel a little bit, but I could kind of cut back on the travel and expect others to do that role. And um, again, I like to lead a team, and so it was a, an opportunity that just kind of presented itself, and so I went with it. And you were associate director. You hired Travis, right, as yep. associate director of admissions. Yep. Um, and then how long were you in that role? And then how did roles change? I know this is higher ed. I mean, we we who work here understand, like, your, your title today may not be your title tomorrow. But maybe you can speak about, like, what you do in a job, like, your actual contributions versus what your title is, maybe. For sure. Um, so I was in the uh, associate director role 16 years. So I was in that for a long time. And then my current position, I've been in about two and a half to three. And so, yeah, you have a job title, but there's a lot more responsibilities that go into it. So I'm going to give an example that just happened this morning. I mentioned earlier, I came in at five, was working on some reports and some things like that. And then we have our reps getting ready to go out today for a couple of visits. And we have a fairly new staff. And so my new staff member, who I will not name, uh, went to pick up the state car and there was a huge pile of snow or snow drift in the front of that vehicle. And so she called over and fortunately I had a, a, a shovel in the back of my truck. And so I went over and scooped the snow out from in front of her vehicle. But um, I think it's really in higher ed, it's all hands on deck. And so it's the ability and the willingness to do anything from scooping snow to building a strategy about how you want to place, you know, marketing or advertisement in a Kansas City or a specific territory region or region. So it's kind of going from thinking big picture to how you can support your team so they're successful, I guess is what I would say. So to me, it really doesn't matter what title I have. I'm willing to, to do whatever work needs to get done to accomplish the goal. And part of my philosophy too is what I've, I've always shared is like, I really won't ask someone to do something unless I'm willing to do it myself. And so I try to lead by example. And, and so if there's tasks that I'm asking my staff to do that might be, you know, hard, challenging, concerning on their behalf, I'll try to take on some of that role to show that I'm willing to do that work too, so. 
That's one of the things as someone who worked for you, I always appreciated that, you know, Fridays were crazy and you would step in and do overviews to help us out. And when we had big phone lists in the summer, you would call and you had done the job before. So I always, I always had a sense of that when I worked for you that, you know, you've done this before, you know, what, what is, you know, how to do it successfully. So you can help me do it successfully, but then you're not afraid to get your hands dirty too. And I'd never had a boss that did that before. And that really kind of changed my perspective of, what a le what a good leader does. So, you know, you were kind of my first example of a, what a good boss could be like. So I very much appreciate that. So yeah, it was nice to have somebody who'd been there and done that and had the t-shirt from it and kind of understood how everything worked. That was really nice. Yeah, we were, we had a recent staff meeting. So thank you, Travis. We had yeah. a recent staff meeting and I told the staff, like, you're probably going to, sometimes you'll like this, sometimes you'll hate it. But from living the job and knowing the job so well, there's often times that I really get in the weeds with everyone. So yeah. <laughs> sometimes they're probably like, oh my gosh, here he goes again. So I think that's a key point, though. Like, the longer that I'm here, I, and I talk about it as like, agility or flexibility to be able to to go from you know putting chairs on the cart to mm -hmm. like you said like planning strategy or some sort of argumentation for some rhetoric that you have to deliver mm -hmm. um but i think i think maybe that's not appreciated as much as it should be because really to be able to go and it's not even like you're in the weeds like you're in the roots of the weeds right mm -hmm. like to be able to go from that and then to like go up to the thirty thousand foot view and go back up and down again Honestly, so in all of these interviews that I've done for the podcast, that's one of the really key traits I think that makes mm -hmm. it makes Northwest a great place to work because there are so many people like you, Jeremy, who are able and capable of doing that. And I think that's not a skill that's often recognized. And and thank I you would, for bringing that out. I, I yeah, for sure. That. And I would say, and this there's probably two, two avenues for it. Like there's the one, like, honestly, that's just me as a person. Like I want to help my fellow coworker, my neighbor, whoever it may be, I'm all about helping people. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is again, kind of the goal related aspect. If, if that recruiter couldn't get the state car out and then they're late to their first visit, it could really impact the long-term success of Northwest because mm -hmm. Again, as Travis knows, if that first visit doesn't go well, the rest of your day just kind of feels like it's sabotaged <laughs> in a sense. So nope. um, we want to, and this is their first visit. So I want to make sure it's a positive experience for day one versus having a nightmare of an experience. So nope. there's, it's multifaceted, I guess, when you're willing to help people. And, you know, in our involvement, in our office's involvement in tours, to circle back around to your humor comment, yeah. um, what, what you really don't, see unless you're in in the active phase of recruiting students is how much that humor or that rapport between departments or between people mm -hmm. really contributes to that that positive uh, mm -hmm. atmosphere for the recruit who's going around and just you know seeing every different department that that piece of humor is far more valuable mm -hmm. I think than a lot of people realize yeah I, I agree I think humor is extremely important and I think it's also the personalization. Like mm -hmm. I love humor, as I mentioned, but you have to know who loves humor as well. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to use humor with someone who's not a humor fan or appreciates humor can be, it can sabotage your work with that person. So you kind of have to dip your toe in the water and kind of mm -hmm. learn to know who you're working with. And that's kind of true of our tour program. Like you have to really get to know the family when you first step out of Mabel Cook and find out their style of communication, um, reading body language and, and kind of finding out if that's the right right fit for your family if they're more mm -hmm. structured and more more serious about decision about the decision making of college. Yeah, I can't tell you how many students we've had. And actually, we just did an interview that came out last week with with one of our students, Sadie Graham, who mentioned, you know, she was from Stanton, Iowa and was here on Ag Contest. And Joe actually was like, hey, you need to come to our campus, you know, and look at our Ag program. And when she did the tour, everybody was friendly. So she came to Northwest. We hear that story again and again from students. And I really think, you know, you, you treat them, you know, like people when they come for the tour. And then you just rely on the Northwest community to just be nice because, you know, Northwest nice is a really real thing. And <laughs> it makes a huge difference in how comfortable somebody feels walking around. I, when I was on the road, I thought that my job was really to get them to campus and then campus would take care of the rest because it's it's a beautiful place. People are great and we have a lot to offer. So yeah. I think we do a really good job. And I, I hope this doesn't come across as negative when I share it, but I call it under promise over value. I mean, you hear that yeah. quite often, but I think we we promise a lot, but I really think we over deliver mm -hmm. um, 
with what we provide. So that's kind of been my mantra too, whether it was selling ads at the newspaper or working here on campus is if I'm working with a family, they can guarantee they're going to get the best service from me and, and searching, researching information they may need or anything I can do to help help with their college decision making. And I feel like that's kind of the Northwest way is, mm -hmm. you know, we're pretty humble about what we do and we, we do talk about it, but I think people don't realize until they actually experience how much we over deliver on, on what they receive here on campus. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, Jeremy, question for you. You know, yeah. if you've listened to it, what does it mean to you, a prominent Bearcat of Bearcats to be a Bearcat? To me, Bearcat means community. Um, you're kind of, you're, I guess, ingrained into a new group, for lack of a better term. It's once you're here, once a Bearcat, always a Bearcat. I know that's often phrased and shared and tweeted and hashtag, but I really feel that's what it's all about is like mm -hmm. you come in and you become a part of our, our family and then you're always a part of that family whether you finish if you finish if you continue on if you come back and get a second degree if you're an alum and you're disconnected and you connect back in like I, I just feel like it's a, a family atmosphere family word it's kind of the best way I can phrase it and that's not the best way to share it but I think that's what it means to me awesome any questions, Travis? I, I know just, I can see it in your yeah, eyes. Just, I just one more. I know we you hire a whole bunch of students as tour guides and, you know, to do help with recruitment. So for the students who are listening, like what, what is it that you really look for in a student when they apply for a position? Is there certain skills that you want or a certain type of personality or what really makes a student stand out for you? Yeah, I think the, the big keys when looking at student employment are honestly professional positions um, would be an ability to communicate with a wide range of people. Uh, thinking on your feet. That's where we try to throw some curveball questions in to see how a, how a student's going to react or a staff will react to common questions or off the wall questions that come up. Because in what we do, you never really know what to expect or what direction the conversation is going to go. So the ability to think on your feet is key. Um, and then I think with the ambassador position too, like it's not probably the first tier, but if they're involved across campus, that's helpful because they have so many experiences that they can build upon and talk about when they're on campus with a, you know, with a family going out on tour. So um, again, strong communication skills is probably built in since you are talking with a lot of students. But I would say those are probably the big four um, that we really look for when we're first starting with the ambassadors specifically. Oh, that's great insight. Mm -hmm. All right, end of interview. Your your flat plane. Uh, to share with us whatever's on your mind. What have you got for us today, Jeremy? Ooh, um, that's always tough. Uh, I'm pretty straight and narrow, I guess. But I'll, I guess the biggest thing I would have is, you know, it's pretty crazy times right now. And I would just say, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated and, and pick up your fellow person. Because like I mentioned, like I'm all about taking care of people. And so I try to help my neighbors out as much as possible or the people I work with. And I, I always share this meme on Facebook, whenever it comes back up on my timeline, but um, actions speak louder than words. So we can talk all day on social media about how we want change or what we want to change, but unless we're willing to do it firsthand, then it doesn't have the same impact. So I think people need to, to realize that and do more for their, for their communities and for the people they work with. Awesome. Those are great words to end Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being our guest, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Well, that will do it for another episode of Behind the Bearcat, and we'll talk to you next time. Hey, guys, we hope you enjoyed that episode. Don't forget to follow on your podcast platform of choice and on YouTube. Also, click the little notification bell on YouTube so you never miss an upload. And you can follow us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and we have a LinkedIn page.